Welcome back to the Tapes Archive Podcast, where we release interviews that have never been heard before. In this episode, we have Thunderfingers himself, John Entwistle. At the time of this interview in 1996, Entwistle was 51 years old and was out on his fourth solo tour. In the interview, Entwistle talks about why he picked up the bass, his sometimes forgotten contribution to the Who's music, and surprisingly how his hearing loss wasn't from live performances with the Who. As always, we have music critic Mark Allen at the helm conducting the interview. If you'd like to support the show, please like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. There, we post other content and information not available on the podcast. If you'd like to read the transcripts for any of our episodes, please head over to our website at thetapesarchive.com. We'll jump into the interview after a quick word from our sponsors. The Tapes Archive is proud to be sponsored by the true crime documentary, Dead Man's Line. You've got a hundred armed officers around here trying to get a shot at me. I dared him to shoot me. I didn't go down there to be a buffoon. I went down there for vengeance. And God God, I have vengeance. In 1977, Tony Karitsis kidnapped a mortgage broker and held him captive for three days. For the first time ever, the media was able to cover the event live. To some, Tony was a hero. To others, he was a crazed thug. Dead Man's Line. The true story of Tony Karitsis. This award-winning film is available exclusively on Amazon Prime. One last thing before we get to the interview, the Tapes Archive podcast is a proud member of Osiris Media, a global community connecting passionate fans with podcasts and experiences about artists and topics you love. Thanks for tuning in, and now it's time to open the vault. Good afternoon, my father. Uh, John, and whistle, please. What is the last name, please? Ent Whistle, E-N-T-W-I-S-T-L-E. Not registered. Uh, do you have a Ken Jones there? Because uh, yeah, I think it is Mr. Other Thing. They, they, they should be with. He should be with Ken Jones. Oh, I think Other Thing is Aunt Whistle. I'm sorry. He's registered as Mr. Other Thing. Oh, okay. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. oh, Hello. Hi, is this John? Yeah. It's Mark, Mark Allen. Hi. Hi. Um, you're, are we okay to talk now? Yeah, fine. Great. Uh, how are you? Okay. I remember you being on the road a, a years ago as a solo album in like uh, I want to say mid seventies or so, and I don't think tour that you've done as a solo act has passed my way since. So uh, kind of... Well, I did uh, I did a tour with Matt Ray Squire, and I went with a band called The Rock. I was back about eighty seven, eighty eight. This is my fourth, actually, fourth. Is that right? Anyway, we we tell me some about this tour. I mean, uh, I've gotten really no background information so what what do you I, I take it you're playing a mix of of things you wrote for the who and and your own solo stuff and uh like that can you just uh, tell me what you're what you're up to on the store um yeah actually selling an album that uh, never got released about uh, eight years ago called the rock and uh, we're selling that on the tour three or four songs from that what kind of a band do you have a good one <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> but uh, how big a band? And, uh, um, it's it's just four. It's really okay. myself, Steve Longo, that's uh, L U O N G O on drums, and uh, Godfrey Townsend on guitar, and Alan St. John, uh, S T J O N on keyboards. It's a you know, small band, but the uh, smaller the band, the more freedom you get. Are you doing all the vocals? Uh, no, we're splitting it between us. We all, we all do vocals. As far as the Who tunes you're doing, are they strictly the ones that you wrote? Uh, I think there are only two that aren't. And, uh, that's, uh, I think we've been using some of them. Uh, some of them uh, I can see for Miles as part of a medley. And The Real Me, which is a, a, a bass solo. Yeah, and, and since you brought that up, I, I think that that's like the, the perfect song that that shows what you did with the Who that people never, I, I either never fully realized or never fully appreciated. I mean, that is a bass song more than anything else. And I think you know everybody has this idea that it was a guitar band, but it really was a bass band, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 bass, the bass song is, is mostly me. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I played all the brass on that as well. So. Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. 
can you talk about your role and, and do you feel like you were underappreciated and, uh, and that you're underrated as far as what you contributed? Well, yeah, I guess I always, always have. I was appreciated by the my fellow musicians who actually sort of knew what I was doing. Man. But the I mean, general public didn't really know what was what was actually sort of attributed. Were you appreciated by the band? Uh, yeah, but I mean, they didn't particularly go out of the way to tell people about it. No. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that, and I, I, it seems to me that on uh, Odds and Sods, there's kind of uh, kind of an oblique reference on Postcard where Pete says how he's mixing it, and that's the reason he's only playing uh, one chord in the whole song. But it's sort of like, it doesn't say, well, you know, really this song is John, and this is, uh, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, if you look throughout our songs, you will find that a lot of our songs are held together by the bass. I hate to sound sour grapes and I don't go around telling everybody, no, it was me, it was me, it was me. I did that bit, I did that bit. Yeah, uh, but it is true. How did you come to pick up a bass? Because it, didn't you, when you started out, you were playing trumpet, right? In, in the early uh, well, I started on piano. Piano. I managed to convince my mother when I was uh, 11 that I could actually carry on teaching myself to play the piano, but I'd really like to play the trumpet. Basically, there were too many trumpet players around there because it was jazz days. Right. The, the school orchestra gave me a venture on instead, so I took up classical horn. And, uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was never really happy with jazz, you know, but rock and roll, I started discovering rock and roll. Uh, it was just starting out, you know. I really wanted to change an instrument, you know, no one wanted a trumpet player in their band. You know, if I'd been a sax player, okay, but uh, I was a trumpet player, and that didn't fit, so I, I made myself a bass guitar. You made yourself a bass guitar? Yeah, yeah, I couldn't afford to buy one. So I made it. It didn't live very long. I might as well have just you know, sort of bought one. But then I managed to buy some, a stolen body and some stolen parts. <laughs> I made myself one for about eight pounds. You know, but, but we had a, a local factory, uh, Fence and Wild. It used to be Burns Wild. And uh, it was just around the corner from where I lived, so I managed to procure the parts. Ended up uh, well, I suppose you could call it a real bass. It wasn't exactly wonderful, but it's... And what made you want to play the bass? Uh, basically, the, 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 uh, the sound of it, yeah. Really? I was a very bad bass player in a lot of bad bands when I was a kid, and... Uh... I, 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 always, I always thought that Dwayne Eddy played bass. Uh-huh. I mean, uh, the... <laughs> well... I mean, he played a lot of low, low parts, and I, I, I liked Dwayne Eddy in the, in the first couple of albums that he did. I, I always felt the bass was kind of like more sinister, more phallic. Yeah, yeah and I, I, but usually the people who pick up the bass are kind of like the last guy to get into the band. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like we need a bass player. You play bass. Yeah, uh, that was kind of the opposite for me. Yeah, yeah, which is uh, which is really interesting. Were you immediately good at it? I mean, was it is it a hard instrument for you to master? Um, I, I I picked it up pretty quickly because I, I had that music background. I've been reading music and uh, I've been reading music since I was six. I just fell, I just fell right into it. It took me a little while to uh, to build up my own playing style. But that came by a mistake. You know, I, I, I saw this bass player playing with his first two fingers. I figured, well, I should be able to do that dead easy because I played the trumpet with my right hand, French horn with my left, and I played piano. So I started playing with, with two fingers. I met the guy a couple of years later. He came up and said, no, oh, I'm... Oh, you know, I was using all four fingers by then, you know, five fingers. And he was amazed at my, at my finger style. And I said, well, I, I got it from you anyway. You know, well, I, I saw you. And he said, oh, no. He said, uh, I always play with my thumb. And he said, uh, I had a big blister on my thumb, so I played with my first finger. When that got blister on it, I played with my second. <laughs> uh, it, was all a, it was all a fallacy. Oh, that's that's a pretty funny story. I like that. Um, when you write songs, do you write on the bass? Um, sometimes, I, usually, I, I write on keyboards or or eight string bass if it's if it's that style of song. Wow. So um, so let me throw out a couple of song titles of yours and tell me. I mean, like uh, my wife. How did you write that? One? Uh, that was a that was a weird one. I actually wrote that with no instrument at all. I uh, I had an argument with my wife. And I took my two. Uh, Scottish deer house for a walk and uh, I made up this imaginary wife that was chasing me and uh, it kind of came from that I, I had the tune and the words in my head at the same time Boris the Spider that must have been written on bass right? Uh, that was that was on bass but that was kind of an instant instant song that uh, I was embarrassed that I hadn't written another song so I made it 
off if I went along. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, I'll dial us one more. I'm heaven and hell. Heaven and hell, that was, uh, I was written on bass. So uh, I wrote Cousin Kevin uh, from Tommy on piano, you know, like juicy piano. And uh, a lot of the others, uh, you know, obviously the ones with, with where the eight string figures like Success Story, I was written on eight string. But most of them are on uh, either piano or, or some kind of synthesizer. Along with people not really recognizing your contributions to the, the Who music, do you think people are aware? I mean, especially toward the, the later days of the Who, I think you wrote probably the best songs that, that ended up on the albums. Do you think? Do you think people are aware that uh, that you were a songwriter and a contributor in that way? Um, I think so. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it gets it gets a little difficult now because everything comes out on CD and the writing's much smaller. <laughs> you can't get as much info. On. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I found a lot of people have forgotten that I actually played all, all the horns and, and brass on Tommy and Quadrophenia and the soundtrack of the films. It kind of up, upsets me a little bit, but I mean, you can't fit everything on the CD, I okay? So do you feel like when you're on this tour that, that maybe people are getting like a real a rediscovery of John and Whistle that maybe they're uh, I think they are, yeah. I mean, from what I've done with a couple of concerts so far, because I, I get a lot of I get a lot more room on this tour to stretch out and play some bass solos, but well, they're not really bass solos, they're bass guitar solos. I think bass solos are pretty boring, <laughs> but uh, bass guitar solos are. Uh, how do you differentiate that? Uh, bass guitar sounds like a guitar, it's just an octave lower. You know, as far as bass is concerned, it's, it's uh, a bass sound, you know, a boomy sound. Are there other bass players that you admire? Um, not really. I mean, no. there, there are other bass players that, that uh, went along the same lines as me, uh, but a little later than I did. Uh, Chris Squire, Billy Shear, and they all play a kind of a lead bass sound. But, um, not really, it's not really using the same sound as myself. I, I use a, uh, mostly guitar amps on the top end. I have my clean bass sound down the bottom, but I'm, I, it's, it's more of a guitar amplifier. In fact, if the guitar is plugged in, it'll get an amazing sound. You mentioned Tommy. Have you seen the Broadway show? Uh, several times, yeah. And your impression? It's pretty good for Broadway. It's about as rock and roll as you'll get for Broadway, I guess. The extra song, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and how about the changes of the lyrics? Sorry, but... I mean, you know, Tommy is now uh, kind of a normal guy instead of the Messiah. Uh, I guess it's a bad week. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I just I listen to him when he when he's uh, when they sing "Freedom Lies Here in Normality" uh, and I'm free, and I think uh, I don't know. I can't really listen to this. You know, it uh, to me it kind of ruins the uh, what you guys had created. So, and uh, I wonder how you felt about it. I know it's Tommy with a suit on. <laughs> That's right, Tommy. Tommy's grown up and gotten a job. I guess. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. You've seen it several times, though, so, so obviously yeah, you must like yeah, it. So. I, I, saw, I saw the toy version in L.A. Um, I almost got to see the German version, but I uh, had a severe reaction to the program. <laughs> okay. um, I read something that, that you're working on some books about the history of The Who. No, it's not a history. It's, it's, it's more like our story from, from my point of view. Okay. It's a funny book. It's not a serious, like... Yeah. Tear the whole apart. They've gone. Are there there's misconceptions that uh, that you think should be cleared up about the who and uh, uh, there, there are thousands. Yeah. Okay, you want to give most me... of the people that wrote wrote books about the who I've never even met before. Would you like to clear up one or two now? No. No. Okay. All right. <laughs> it sounds much better when it's it, it, when it's written in a funny way rather than. You know, okay. Um, I, and... I tend to rant and rave when I when I talk about the who and then. All right. <laughs> Is it three books? Did I read that right? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get the first one finished by the end of this year, but um, uh, hopefully nothing will crop up to, to make me put it back on the shelf again. And do you have a publisher? They're certainly interested, but uh, I haven't actually started uh, passing it around yet. Uh, you've got some reissues or, or new discs in the works, something like that? There's a, a remix. It's just called Entwistle, which is a selection of songs from the, the solo album. And then a few months after that, I believe they're going to release the solo albums in, in the right order. Is that right? Okay. Is that all on Rhino? 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. For for a little bit. repertoire in Europe. What will people learn about you from the solo albums? Do you think? I mean, it's been a long time since I've listened to some a couple of them, and uh, so I'm probably, wondering... probably done them a little strange. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> No, to be covered the archer. Uh, no, 
I, oh, oh, that's right. You know that that art show was supposed to come here. I thought, and uh, it, it, to Indianapolis, and uh, um, and I don't think it did. Yeah, you know, it's kind of running about a month after the, 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 the tour started. Right? It, it's kind of uh, we're starting in Cleveland now. I'm doing a signing in the uh, Hall of Fame, and then the art show is opposite the Hall of Fame. A series of lithographs that I've uh, I, after I did the Who by Numbers cover, it got me interested in art again. This gallery out of out of Colorado. Uh, yeah, Walnut Street Gallery. Right, Walnut Street. Yeah, Laura Evely is a friend of mine. I, uh, so I, I got a flyer from her a while back saying that 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 show was going to come here, but it never did. So I guess it got delayed. That's right. Where are you based from? Uh, Indianapolis. Indianapolis. But at any rate, um, so these are lithographs of uh, of uh, different pictures that you've drawn of uh, um, music. Oh yeah, great cartoons. Uh, oh, cartoons. Cartoons of rock stars. Is there a Keith Moon cartoon in the collection? Yeah, there's a couple, couple of, uh, like, imagining the ancestors I threw in there. Do you know, I could call Walnut Street Gallery, and they'll know when it's coming to town, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's not traveling with you, right? Um, I might have to, uh, after the music tour's finished, I might have to visit a few places that I missed, because uh, we couldn't really tie them all up at the same time as the concerts. We're trying as close as we can. Well, I will, uh, I'll definitely mention that, and I uh, appreciate your time. Good luck with the tour. Hope everything goes well, and uh, I'll see you in a week or so. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tapes Archive podcast. Please remember you can always find more information about the show and the individual episodes at our website, thetapesarchive.com. Until next time, the vault is closed.